Main Freight's boss, Don Braid, just bought 10,000 more shares, taking a stake to $197 million. A fund manager says this is the kind of insider trading that investors want to see. It's about alignment. It's about saying they've got skin in the game. For that reason, listed tech company Circo wants all its employees to own equity. We try and get everybody to have shares inside Circo. So when myself and Bob founded Circo, we gave 40% of the company away to the team. It's Monday the 7th of August and you're watching Markets with Madison. If you're investing in a company, you want to know the intentions of its leaders, right? Well, nothing proves that they're in it for the long haul like holding their own stock and a decent amount of it. So here's the top 10 New Zealand companies with the largest insider equity holdings. Number one is the Warehouse Group, with 27% of its equity held solely by its founder, Sir Stephen Tyndall. His foundation also owns another 21%. I asked him to come on the show to talk about it, but he says he prefers to keep his head down. Second is Helen Stein Glassens, and that's because the founder of women's store Glassens, Timothy Glasson, still owns 20% and is on the board. Third is Main Freight. Its founders, Bruce Plested and Carl Howard Smith, collectively own almost 15%, while managing director Don Braid owns almost 3%. Next is Ryman Healthcare. Its co-founder, Kevin Hickman, still owns almost 5%, while Canadian director Jeffrey Cumming owns more than 7%. Circo is still largely founder-owned. Darren Grafton owns 9% of the tourism company. He'll explain why a little later in the show. Some of Vulcan Steel's executives own between 4 and 5% each. The founder, Peter Wells, still owns 14%, but he isn't counted as an insider here because he's not on the board or exec team anymore. Vista Group sits above 7% with existing and also former directors holding equity. All directors at the market operator NZX bought more equity in June under a share purchase plan. The new chair, John McMahon, bought $45,000 worth in May. Oceania Healthcare's CEO owns equity under his incentive scheme, while the chair Liz Coote's portion is valued at $1.5 million. Interests associated with another independent director also own 3%. Scalar Up's chief executive, David Meir, holds 2.5% of the company. But him and the CFO collectively sold $1.7 million worth of equity late last year. They were then issued more shares under an option plan. I got most of that info from companies' office records and disclosure notices posted to the NZX announcement page. You can go and see them for yourself. They reveal how many shares anyone involved in the company is buying or selling, and also the price attached to it. The numbers were also run by Harbour Asset Management. Its director, Shane Solly, told me why it pays attention to insider trades. Shane, good to see you. Hey, Maddie, how are you going? Yeah, I'm really well, thanks. Good. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. Yeah. What do you think when you see an insider of a listed company buying equity? Well, if you step back and understand what an insider is, insider is either a management team member, a director, a founder, and generally they know a little bit more than the rest of us about what's happening with their business. So if they're buying or selling shares in a company, it's sort of a pretty interesting signal. We, we do sit up and take notice of it. Do you buy companies specifically because insiders hold more equity than others? Look, I think it's uh, the, high, the more uh, of a business that's owned by insiders tends to give us a signal. It's about alignment. It's about saying they've got skin in the game. Basically, they've got conviction that the business they're involved with has got attractive propositions in the, going forward. So, yeah, it's a good signal. It's part of the jigsaw, of course. There's a whole bunch of things we think about, but where there are businesses where the insiders own a bit more stock, that's a pretty helpful sign. Can you give me an example of a stock that you like purely because of insider buying? Well, well I'll give you an example of a business that we like for a lot of different reasons, including insider buying, and one of them would be Main Freight. And certainly that's a business where management and board members and directors own 18% of the company. This is a you know, $7 billion New Zealand company with a really interesting long-term growth path. And the management team keep on adding to that position. That's the, that's the signal that we're looking for. And uh, managing director Don Braid recently bought 10,000 shares. And you know, that's a big number, but that's just under $700,000 worth of shares. That to us means you know, Don's seeing a longer term growth proposition that supports him putting more of his own hard earned money to work in the business. So yeah, that's supporting that investment. 
How do you see that potentially altering the operation of the business? Are they more hands-on if they own as much equity as that? I think it's about uh, thinking about what this means for the long-run return. You know, would, would I do this with my own money? Does this make sense? Does this got to create wealth in the medium term? And I think that's, that's the key signal here is that people are going, this is my money. I need it to deliver a good return through time. Uh, I want to manage risk. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty good sign. What does history say about the long-term gain in shares if there is more insider buying? Does it pay off? Yeah, it's not always instant. So the academic research sort of says where uh, insiders are active, both buying and selling, it does tend to have a signal to future returns from those shares. Not straight away, generally over a one year plus period of time. So it's not instant, it's not instant. But yes, there's generally a signal if they're buying, it's more positive, and if they're Similarly, if they're selling, it's generally a little bit of a negative, well, we've got to be careful here. When it comes to skin of the game as well, I guess it's more impressive when the market cap of a company is as high as main freight and they're still buying stock at that price and at that level, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think that's a really interesting point that we've got a number of emerging companies here in New Zealand where very founder-led, big, chunky ownership of companies that are smaller and growing. And So we've got a number of businesses that are less than a billion uh, market capitalization. Obviously, market capitalization is the number of issued shares times by the share price. Uh, and so, there's a number of companies that are below a billion dollars, still growing businesses where the founders have got, you know, up to 70% of the stock, more than 20 in many cases. So that's again, there's good alignment. They really want to make these businesses successful in the medium term. Is there perhaps a downside of that, though, of them being so tightly held? That makes them really liquid, does it not? Yeah, so that's a really great point. So we want to balance. Uh, so the liquidity is the ability to, to buy and sell shares, so to increase your investment or decrease your investment. And if that liquidity is low, and that's a function of the market capitalization and the free float, what's available to buy and sell. So we want to balance. We want people to have a meaningful investment. It really changes their own personal wealth long term but also the ability to, to buy and sell. So there is a balance to be had. You know, too much held by one or two people makes it very hard to, to invest in the business. What would you say is the sort of ideal percentage that uh, a CEO or a director should hold in the stock of a company that they lead? Because the variance is quite large. Yeah, it is huge. And, and yeah, we've got to remember some very large businesses when you start working out the percentages uh, those are big numbers <laughs> for many people personally to have an investment in. Mm -hmm. So we get that. So it is really about what is a, what would a reasonable amount be relative to what their normal annual income or salary is? Um, what actually makes the difference for them if, they, if it goes wrong? You know, if they were to lose several hundred thousand dollars, would that be a meaningful hit? Yeah, for most people it would be. So that's the sort of number you want to start with. Um, but it's, again, it's, just, it's the change sometimes. It's more about, hey, they've added to the position. Um, and you know, if you go back, not always uh, are they adding at the point where things are wonderful. Sometimes they're adding it when it's challenging. And that in, in itself is a signal is, hey, long term, we back this business. We know it's tough at the moment, but long term, we like it. Incentive schemes play quite a big role here as well. We see that executives do get paid bonuses and the issued equity as part of their contract. So how much weight should we place on that versus them just using their own money to buy shares? So for many executives in particular, there's uh, what's called stock options. It's the, if they hit certain performance targets, then they actually get stock in the company or shares in the company they're working for. And so that's a slightly different driver from them using hard-earned tax-paid money. It's slightly different, still positive, so it still gives a stretch, it's about the management teams hitting those key targets and there's a wider range of different uh, targets they have to hit to get that stock options kicking through. Whereas if they're investing their own money, it's, hey, I've, I've made the money, I've paid tax, I'm actually thinking I actually want to add to that investment. Um, we, we think they're both really helpful. They are slightly different in terms of their impact uh, and so certainly putting your own real hard earned money to work is is a real, that's putting something, that is real skin on the game. We see a lot of directors that are buying in incremental amounts, right? Should we read into anything to do with the timing and the current stock price as to whether or not they think their stock is undervalued? Yeah, the, quite often uh, insiders, the directors, management team and so forth, they're quite constrained about when they can be actively buying or selling shares in the market. Uh, quite rightly, they've got uh, annual and semi-annual results that they provide to the public. And so they have to be out. There's got to be a window around that. Anything else that could be 
share price sensitive, has to be disclosed. So it's quite often there's not many opportunities for those insiders to actually be actively buying and selling their own shares. So it can be quite a narrow window. But yeah, so certainly the, the magnitude, the timing, those things are all important. Uh, you know, as I say, if a company management person is buying shares in a meaningful point at a low point in their business, yeah, that means we've got to hey, let's go and have a look at this thing and see what they're saying. I'm being cynical here, but could they use it as a strategy to boost confidence in the market and other shareholders? Could they just, you know, they get paid quite decent amounts, they could put a little bit aside to buy some stock to try and help boost the share price overall? Yeah, look, I think we've got to be wary of that. In some cases that may happen. Uh, and so you've got to look at what's the track record of, of that particular person's buying and selling. Has there subsequently been a positive trend or indeed, as you say, or has it just been a bit of a jazz hands, right? Um, don't look at my feet, look at my hands. <laughs> I'm just doing this. So we are sort of, you've got to be wary. And again, so when we see uh, insiders buying or selling shares, it is part of the bigger picture when you're investing in shares. It's just one component. Thanks so much for your time, Shane. So interesting. Thanks, Maddie. I spoke to Main Freight's Don Braid about his recent share purchase, and while he wasn't keen to do an interview on the show about it, he did tell me that he's a believer in the business. He says he bought the shares to take advantage of the market currently being disappointed in his business, while he's not. Quote, the share price looked attractive, so I took the opportunity to buy. Another listed company, Serco, issued 2 million shares to staff in June, taking its total incentive scheme to 2.5% of all equity on issue. But this one isn't just for execs or directors. Founder and Chief Executive Darren Grafton told me why it's open to all employees. Darren, thanks so much for your time. Good to see you. Thank you. Darren, can you please explain the employee share scheme that Serco currently has in place? Yeah, so we have a, what we call a, our employee share scheme is kind of set up for everybody. And it's a, it's a key scheme that we kind of put in place, which is based on the performance of Serco and how well we do and how well the team's performing to execute towards our goals. We allocate shares to across all the staff. And that's one of the things that's quite key to our program is it's inclusive and we're all in it together. How much equity are people allowed to hold? Is there a maximum minimum? No, there's no, it's, it's based on your salary and some people, everybody, we try and get everybody to have shares inside Serco. So when myself and Bob founded Serco, we gave 40% of the company away to the team. And it was really about how do you create that environment where you know you're you're all working together for this really audacious goal and how do you sort of be part of that and if we win you win through that and so we try and push it through all of the company and so they will get some when they start and then they based on what they earn they can actually um, and the way the company performs they'll they'll get some more stock through that as well. Pretty clear why you implemented it. You wanted employees to have skin in the game like you do as a founder, right? But why also keep it? Circo has very clearly grown since you founded it. So why keep implementing it today? I think it's for us it's the culture. So it's really important to be in it together um, and to be part of that journey and to be part of the company. Um, you know, it's kind of what you know, it feels like it's yours. And I think that's that part of ownership that I really love. You know, as a, as a founder, I consider myself as the same as the founding team. And, uh, and it's that whole part of saying, when we said to the board, we want everybody to be a shareholder, they're like, oh, this isn't normal. Um, but that was what we did. And, and so it's, it's kind of those really cool aspects of everybody's together and, and we're all in it for the same goal. So. Would you recommend other companies take yeah, up no, the same sort of scale? I think it's probably more common in America than it is down here. Uh, and I think it's really unusual for founders to just give away 40% of the company to the team. But it's kind of that environment that we tried to create, that, that culture. Uh, and it wasn't about the money, it was about what we would do together and that execution would generate the value. And so if we're in it like our shareholders that invest with us, then we're all at the same level and we have that same opportunity together. And I think it's kind of that, that part of like our, our philosophy is to bring people together. And so we're all together in, in shareholders as well. So it kind of ties into our purpose as well. That's great in the great times too, I can imagine. But what about in the tough times? You've just gone through COVID, you're a tourism company, it would have been pretty tough. How did it 
change the culture uh, having a share scheme while things were a little bit I, I mean uh, it's one of those sort of aspects to say you know you're in it and you know you're the stocks at a certain level you get a benefit in those years where the stock is lower you know you earn shares at that rate and then we're going to execute out of that so what it did is made us really close together and the team that were with us kind of really kind of focused on what we needed to do to get out of that, what we could control. And that was the only thing we could turn up to do together and execute through that. And it was really surprising that, that everybody looked for the opportunities, what we could do, where we could earn money, where we could build to the next thing. And that passion was just phenomenal. And we did exceptionally. Like through COVID, if you see the Circo story, we won awards. And we really did some phenomenal work with Booking.com, and, and I think that was all part. We're all part of it together, so it was, it was awesome. You still own almost nine yeah. percent. How do you think that that determines your behaviour as a leader of this company? Well, I, I'm also one of the largest shareholders, so I have um, a lot at stake. So I, I'm, I'm, I have a vested interest, I guess, in the outcome of Circo. Um, it's success like everybody and the philosophy that I've set in place was I wanted people to if they leave Circo to be better off both in the knowledge that they gained at Circo but also financially and the shares was that mechanism to do that uh, and I'm, I'm really proud that you know we've got so many people that have portfolios of shares inside Circo that has literally changed their lives they've paid off mortgages and they've bought houses that they would never have been able to afford any other way and that's that's pretty awesome as a founder to see it change people's life through how they work and and what work's been able to do for them and I think that's core to our culture and, and values I guess as well. The share price is looking pretty attractive currently it's up 75 percent in the past year yeah. would you look to sell down? No so like um, I'm I kind of turn up for the the dream of can we take Circo to this phenomenal part for business travel and part of that has been on the journey and so for me it's that long-term vision of of what drives me to get up is is it possible is it possible to have 20 percent of the world's business travelers using our technology out there what what's our audacious goal that we're actually setting what's their dream and that's really what I kind of a minute for as well what's what's there in the long term do you think you yourself as a leader or any other leader of a company can have that same ambition and drive for success internally if they don't have such big skin in the game I think it's always interesting um, with founder led businesses uh, and I think um, you know, for me, businesses that I invest into are normally people that are founder-led because there's this little X factor in how they think about risk and how they think about the opportunity and they're driving for how and what that means for them and their team if they've built that type of culture. So it is, I think it is a special factor in having the way that we've done it and other people are starting to look at those types of things and I think it's it's I think it's, I would say, I always say our people are our X factor. Our product is something we produce, but our people are the things that actually drive the outcomes that are quite exceptional. Thanks so much for your time, Darren. Good to chat. Thank you. I hope you found this insightful. I certainly did when I was researching it all. But yeah, you can only imagine the response I got when I called execs and I said I wanted to talk to them about their insider trading. So let's just agree to call this one insider buying and selling instead. All right? Now go put your money to work.